last week in Revelation, I think we really concentrated a lot of our time and attention on these first couple of things that John is praising Jesus for, that he loves us and that he loosed us from our sins by his own blood. And I didn't have a whole lot of time as a result to comment for a very long period on verse 6. So before we get to verse 7, and I don't know if we'll get to it this morning or not. I'm ready to if we do. But before we get to that, I want to go back and say a few more things that were left somewhat unsaid about verse 6 of Revelation 1. Now, I know it always seems like it takes us a long time to ever get through with a study around here. But that's just the way that that's just the way that the Lord leads me, and that's the way that he has gifted me. Maybe other people just get into it and, and then get right back out of it and stay basically okay, but that's not the way that I'm led. It's not the way that I'm gifted. I'm not going to criticize other people who want to do it that way. I hope they won't criticize me if I feel led to do it this way. To me, it makes the scriptures richer and more understandable whenever I'm certain that whenever I have gone through a text or a chapter or a verse or a passage, and I really do understand what is being said. I don't just have a real superficial view or understanding of it. Now, if you taught once a month or maybe even once a week, then maybe our style of teaching would not be totally justifiable because you'd never get anything done in 10 years, but maybe study Revelation 1-1 in 10 years. Maybe that would not be the... Uh, appropriate approach but four times a week several hundreds of teachings each year well, a whole lot is said around here in a year i mean a whole lot a whole lot is said around here in a year's time you know don't you better than i do because you have to listen to all of it <laughs> i know pretty well too though because i have to work on all of it i work on it and work on it and then teach it and then counsel about it and then <laughs> So it's a never-ending thing, it seems like. I don't mind, though. I'm, I rejoice in my calling that I have. One thing I didn't emphasize, doesn't really need any emphasis, I don't suppose, in the end of verse 5 about him loosing us, is that he looses by his own blood. I do like that he didn't get somebody else's blood. It's his own blood. And this is what the New Testament emphasizes, that we're redeemed, we're bought, we're purchased, we're loosed we're freed we're delivered not by the blood that belongs to somebody or something else the blood of bulls and goats and calves which can never take away sin but we've been purchased with god's own blood it belongs to him that is to his son so if you hold your finger here before we go on i just mentioned that if you hold your finger there and go over to acts chapter 20 and verse 28 you'll see the same thing over here Paul in one place, John in the other. Acts 20, 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Because that, that word own, you could probably spend an hour on it. It has certain meanings. It certainly means this, that God didn't borrow someone else's blood. I mean, it, it, shows, it shows the fact that that, um, that God was the planner of redemption, and that he, and, but, but in the plan, he planned to sacrifice himself. Nobody's ever thought of a thought like that. You plan, and then you put somebody else, make them pay for it. But you plan, man has fallen, you make the plan to help man out, but the way that you make your plan to help man out is not by punishing man, it's by punishing yourself. That's the whole marvel of God's grace in the cross. It's man's problem. He deserves to be punished. This is the whole theme of Christian theology. But God, rather than punishing him, says, I'm going to make a plan. I cannot accept man the way that he is. He is just in an unacceptable state. He is unclean. He's filthy. He's abominable in my sight. I cannot accept him. Something has to be done. What? Send him to purgatory for two millennia? Well, God could have done that, I guess. I mean, could have in, in the sense that a lot of people think of purgatory. We'll go to purgatory and suffer for X number of years. We know that in the true understanding of spiritual matters in the spiritual realm, that suffering for 10 trillion times 100 quinn billion years will not pay for a single sin, not even one sin. 
because you can't overcome sin by suffering for it, not man, because it's a sinner suffering for a sinner. God can't accept that. So he can't accept man in the state that he's in. He's got to do something about it. He makes a plan, and that is a sacrificial, substitutional plan for him, but who he substitutes is himself. God is the author of the plan, and God is the one who carries the plan out, and God is the victim. God is the executor, and God is the victim at the same time. And man is the one who is released as a result of that. So what it shows is the peculiar nature of this all, and I mean peculiar in the sense that it belongs to God. If he has done this by his own blood, then he is jealous for this whole thing called the doctrine of salvation or conversion or justification or the cross. He is very jealous for that because it is his own cross. It is his own sacrifice. It is his own blood. It's not just blood, and it's certainly not somebody else's blood, but the emphasis is it's his own blood. He is the executioner, and he is the victim all at the same time. And therefore, as the New Testament would teach us, woe be unto those who pervert or who misconstrue or who tamper with this doctrine about the cross and the blood of Jesus. Because it's his own. He's done the work. He ought to be the one who has deserved and earned the right to be the interpreter of the cross and not some JDS heretic who's never shed one drop of blood for anybody else's sin. If, God, if it's his own blood and if God is the one who gave himself as a sacrifice for sinners to substitute in their place, Peter says it's the just for the unjust, 1 Peter 3.18, then he deserves to be the one who has the right to interpret the meaning and the significance of the atonement. And, of course, he's done that through his apostles in the New Testament. And will it be unto those who preach any other gospel. Paul said, let them be anathema, let them be accursed if they preach any other gospel. So that word own in there is like the word me of the apostle Paul in Galatians 2.20 who loved me and gave himself for me, it's a personalization of the whole thing. God gave his own blood. Now, he doesn't have to say that word, use that word own, O-W-N, and he doesn't in every place. It's just by the, the blood, the blood. Well, what blood? Well, we know from other passages like this one that it is God's own blood, which means it cost him something, which means all the things that that means. So because it is inscripturated, that term own, I don't want to just jump over it and not say a single thing about it. Who loosed us from our sins by the Hebraic use or meaning of the Greek preposition and in, which normally means in, but in a Hebraic sense it means by. Loosed us from our sins by his own blood. So that medium of exchange was the blood of Christ. The Holy Spirit brings it and applies it. It is the basis of the satisfaction. And the way in which he works this in our heart is the Holy Spirit uses the word of God. The Holy Spirit, Jesus said, a man must be born of the Spirit in order to enter the kingdom. Remember uh, John 3? But James tells us that we're born again by the word of truth. Say, how can you be born again by both? And we're born by the blood. Well, the blood is the price that's been paid. That's the basis. That's the satisfaction. That has to be there before any other member of the Godhead can have any other thing to apply to us. The blood has to be paid. That's been paid. Now, the Holy Spirit's the one who applies that, but how does he do that? In some mystical, unconscious sense? No. How shall they hear without a preacher? Romans 10, 14. They, God has manifested his word, Titus 1, around verse 3, through preaching. So James says in James 1, 18, of his own will begat he us by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures unto him. Of his own will begat he us. Begat, a man must be begotten, born again. Begat he us by the word. The word, the Holy Spirit is the one who administers the word, but the word is that agency that God uses to rebirth us. But it's on the basis of the fact that his blood, his own blood, the blood of Jesus Christ has been shed for us. 
And so as Paul says in Romans 6, we are not under the dominion of sin. He didn't say you won't ever sin, but you're not under the dominion. And that's what uh, John means here in Revelation 1, 5, that he has freed us from the captivity, freed us from the prison house of sin, uh, from which there was no escape except God took this burden upon himself, which he did. He sent his son into the world to die for sinners. That is the, well, I guess I could say it's the central truth of all of biblical revelation, that God sent his son into this world to die in a sinner's stead. We rejoice. We rejoice for that forevermore. And then in verse 6, we read, And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Well, I said that there is no and in the Greek, but rather priest is in opposition, A-P-P-O-S-I-T-I-O-N, in opposition to kings. That is, in some way they go together, one explains the other. And so I think that John has Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6 in mind, where God told the Israelites that he would make them a holy nation and that he would make them a kingdom of priests. And this is what John is saying here. He hath made us a kingdom, which is also how this word, basileia, basileon, can be translated. He hath made us a kingdom of priests unto God and his Father. Now, the scripture in mind is Exodus 19, which we read last time, 5 and 6. That's the backdrop. But the meaning has changed, which I think I also said a word or two about then anyway. There, a kingdom of priests really wasn't the whole nation because the whole nation didn't somehow stand in immediate relationship to him. It was a part of that nation, the tribe of Levi, and a part among them, the priests that descended along the right line and even more uh, narrowed down the high priest and those sons who descended from him. Well, the meaning has changed now. Although John, and I told you this before early in Revelation, that John may use a lot of things from the Old Testament, but you have to be discerning to know, does he mean the exact same thing mentioned back there, or is he just using a phrase? Uh, for instance, I can think of one, I've told you some of these before, but one item comes to mind where uh, John is referring to a passage earlier in the book of Daniel that has reference to Antichrist, to Antichrist. But whenever he's using it in Revelation, it very clearly refers to the devil, to that great dragon of, of Revelation chapter 12. So, so he's changed the, um, the person behind it from Antichrist to the devil. And there's no big difference, no big change in meaning because the devil is the one who will work through Antichrist whenever he comes on the scene. So what I mean here by the meaning changing is that we, we don't, any longer have as the nation of Israel had a special class over us through whom we have to go I didn't say we don't have a special class over us we do the Bible teaches a fivefold ministry uh, situation and setting in the church but we don't have a special class over us through whom we have to go to have access to God now we don't have that anymore contrary to the Roman Catholic Church today contrary to probably all the churches today I mean, it seems like everybody sooner or later in their life is a little Roman Catholic at heart. <laughs> they might have never been a part of it, but that's a great, powerful delusion and religion right there, this old works business. And your Baptists, and they're all in it too. They're in it just as much as in a more subtle fashion. They're not, they know that it's heathenism to bring beads out and start mumbling in a foreign language that's not speaking in tongues and trying to get something from God. They know that's, that's heathenism. That's just plain heathenism. So what do they do? Well, they'll start a bus ministry. Well, you couldn't claim that's heathen because they don't even have motors over there. <laughs> but you're trying to get to God the same way with all of your dumb, dead denominational works. And one of the basic doctrines of Christianity is supposed to be repentance from dead works. And the denominational people have never repented from all the dead works that they are involved in. Or not like the shepherdship people who say that you have someone over you and, and they put this someone over you in the wrong sense, that you come and go according to their bidding and you ask for approval or disapproval of all matters by them, from them. You ask for that or you just don't move. 
Well, the Bible doesn't teach that either. The Bible does teach that, like in the Old Testament, God still does have ministers who are over his people. He has given gifts unto men, Ephesians uh, 4, 8 and follow. He has given certain gifts unto men. They are to be, uh, Paul said, uh, esteemed highly uh, in love for their work's sake. You may not like them a whole lot, as you should. You probably got to take care of an attitude problem, but you may not like them. He said esteem them highly in love for their work's sake. They have a difficult endeavor that they have been called to. It's a very difficult work that they've been called to. And submit yourself to them and obey them. And the Bible says that. Hebrews 13, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, Ephesians 4, because they're there for our good. But they're not the ones through whom we have access to God, you see. We have access to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can all have that access individually and personally. That's what John means whenever he says that we have been made. See, it's something that wasn't true earlier. It's not something that just has always been here. The nation of Israel was a kingdom of priests only in that Old Testament sense. But now it's by his blood. Notice the connection is immediately with the blood. It's right after the cross, and he mentions this. He loved us first. He demonstrated that supremely, climactically, by the death on the cross. And as a result of that death, he has made us something. These three go together as a chain of events here. Something led to something which has produced something. He has made us a kingdom of priests. Now, I know some songs have in them the phrase kings and priests. So I wanted to give a brief comment on that particular thing and on other things that it applies to. I know some songs, maybe some that we sing around here, have the phrase kings and priests rather than a kingdom of priests. Well, that's fine. I never intend by my teaching, by my sometimes technical and precise teaching, to cause you to have to change minor details in your songs. Now, if a song somehow just doesn't have the Spirit's approval upon it, <laughs> and I'm afraid there are a whole lot that are a lot of hymn books, non-charismatic and charismatic that fit that, that just don't have the Spirit's approval upon them, we're just going to have to avoid those type songs. We're going to avoid them because of what they say. But I never intend my precise teaching to cause you to feel that you have to change minor details in songs because you can get so bound, you can become legalistic there. And then before the Lord could ever give you a song, you've got to read the Hebrew and the Greek and study the lexicons and make sure that your King James translation is reliable. And I would say that you're getting in bondage over that. If it's in the King James Version, if it's in almost any version, basically it's okay. Heretical things in songs, Jesus went to hell and was born again, those have to be changed, thrown out. You have to be delivered from that. If we've got a song or songs, and we could probably take the afternoon off to think of the 827 songs that we sing in this church, that's probably not an exaggeration, that we know in this church, we could probably find out right here now, it doesn't, it doesn't say it exactly that way in the New Testament. It does, well, maybe it doesn't. Is it a tremendously significant thing? If it's not, forget about it. Don't worry about it. I'm never intending through all of this to give you a word without saying it, that this song better be changed and that song, if I think it needs to be changed, then I'm not going to beat around the bush about it. I'll just come and tell you about it. I'll come and tell you personally or privately or I'll tell all of us whenever we're together here, we don't need to sing that anymore or we shouldn't sing it that way anymore. All right, praise the Lord, then we'll just change. If we've got biblical reason for changing, we'll just change. But over in, if you'll turn over to Revelation chapter 5 and verse 10, you do happen to have that phrase, kings and priests, over here. And you do have an ant. And because of the last phrase here in this verse, it probably wouldn't be too safe to try to manipulate the word kings. And see, you don't have that in, in Revelation 1.6. See, I just told you earlier, friends, that John can take something from the Old Testament and use it with a little different meaning whenever he gets to his book of Revelation. Well, he can use something in Revelation and then later in Revelation use it 
with a little different meaning. You've got in your King James kings and priests, kings and priests both ways. Well, one time I think it should be kingdom of priests and over here due to the last phrase in this verse. Now, if we didn't have the last phrase, then maybe it's back to a kingdom of priests. But due to the last phrase in this verse, I don't think it'd be too safe to try to manipulate that word kings because look at this last phrase, and we shall reign on the earth. Wait a minute, priests don't reign, priests minister. Kings are the ones who reign. So since the verse does go on to say, and shall reign on the earth, I believe this is a millennial passage here. This is a millennial passage over here. And the emphasis is particularly upon the word kings. Now, priest is included, but then it goes right back to kings, even after saying priest, by this phrase, and we shall reign on the earth. That's the millennial passage there. Look at Revelation 2 and um, 27. Revelation 2 and 27. And he, speaking of he that overcometh, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. He shall rule them, ruling and reigning with Christ. You're going to have to have some other term than priest. You'd have to have a term like prince or ruler or king, which is the term we have in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 10. So whenever we go back then to chapter 1 and verse 6, I think that here the connection is too close in the context with Jesus' work on the cross. See, he loved us. He expressed that in a supreme example by dying on the cross for us. And it had not only the effect of loosing us from our sins, but it had another effect. By this, the Lord Jesus has given us access into personally into the immediate presence of God. That's what he means by this phrase, the kingdom of priests. Uh, if you'll hold your finger there and turn over to two other passages, Romans chapter 5, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein you stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We have access by faith by Jesus Christ into this grace, this place of grace. Well, where is that? Well, that's the throne of grace of Hebrews 4. And what's that? That's the presence of God. We have access into it. And the other passage is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. These are different ways of saying the same thing, essentially. He hath made us a kingdom of priests unto God and his Father. Well, it's by his blood. And Paul tells us this in Hebrews 10, 19. By a new and living way, verse 20, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Well, of course, they saw tremendous spiritual significance in the tearing of the veil, it being rent from top to bottom. And, of course, he goes on then to talk about priests in the high priest sense, Hebrews 10, 21, which is, Jesus Christ, the, not only the high priest, but the great high priest of Hebrews 4. So he's made us priests, individually, kingdom, corporately. We're not priests just out there by ourselves trying to make it. We make up a kingdom. I believe that has reference to the church. Now, the kingdom is bigger, broader than the church. But the church is one particular aspect and manifestation of God's kingdom through immediate rule through his people and through and in their lives. So he has made us priests and this has opened up access to the Father. So I, I did want to comment on that a little more so that we're clear on Revelation 1, 6, Revelation 5, 10. Uh, what both of these mean, how they are slightly different, probably in meaning, and also a word about our songs around here. Now, that then leads me to Revelation 1, 6b. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, I'm not just going to jump over that. Praise God. That's about the most important thing in this. What, what John is wanting to do once he introduces the Godhead to us, the Father, Spirit, and Son, is to praise the Son. And he thinks of various reasons here why Jesus should be praised, but the reasons are one thing, but you could just have all the reasons and then never give God any praise. 
And, you know, that's where a lot of people are. Everybody, we all have a whole lot of reasons to give God praise, but do we give him praise? Everybody who is alive has a reason to say, thank God I'm alive. Everybody who is saved has a reason to say, thank God I'm twice alive. I'm more alive than I used to be. But do they give God? You see, just because they have reason to praise God doesn't mean that they do. And John is not going to say, now, unto him that loved us and loosed us and made us, period. No, unto means you're leading to something. Unto him, well, unto him what? You can't just say unto him that, 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 these things that he did for us. Unto him, unto him what? Unto him that did these things. Now, here's what I want to get to. I want to praise him. Be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Glory speaks of uh, praise and worship and honor and dominion of might and strength and power. Dominion. You know, if you dominate someone, might and strength and power. To him be this, this, this universal power that belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. Forever and ever. One commentary writer, I think it might have been Linsky, said that what John has done is he takes the Greek word for time, eon, multiplies it by itself, and then multiplies it by itself again. And you get forever and ever. We talked about that somewhere in biblical literature. The cult people and cult translations tell us that there's no Greek word for eternity. That there's only the word for time. And that's right. There, it, you don't have a word for eternity in Greek. You have a word for time. But when you have time and you pluralize it and then you multiply it by itself, I don't think you're just talking about times and times and times. You're talking about times and times and times and times forever and ever and ever. That's what you mean by that. It's a figure that has reference to that. Of course, what they're trying to get away from is the eternal punishment of the wicked. They want to say, well, they just suffer for a season because the Greek just has a word for time. For a certain period of time, they suffer. And then after that, well, I guess they're loosed. So they don't want to use that, you know, phrase eternal punishment. But yet they'll use the same verse that talks about the righteous being eternally blessed. Why can't you just say, well, they're going to be blessed for a certain period of time. Then after that, I don't know. If the people judged after that, they get to be blessed. Maybe the people blessed after that, they get to be judged and suffer. They wouldn't want that. So really they're inconsistent. Well, to be sure, the Greek doesn't have a precise, specific term for eternity. But... On the other hand, they do. You take time, you pluralize it, then you multiply it by itself. Eon, you pluralize it, you multiply it by itself, and then what you end up with is a concept of eternity, that is, in the future, eternity, forever and ever. Then he seals it, amen, with the Hebrew, this comes from the Hebrew, with the Hebrew term of certainty. This is ground of assurance, certainty here, so be it, let it be done, amen. Now, what I have called this, of course, is the doxology, the doxology. We as Christians are really to be a people of praise. Amen. We're going to be talking about that a little bit this morning. You know, I kind of on a regular basis around here talk to all of us, all of you about praise, about our responsibilities here, because you go along so long and you just need to talk about that again. Because it is found over and over and over and over in the Bible. We know that's one truth that God restores to a person whenever they experience the baptism in the Holy Spirit, that there is victory in praise. There is power in praise. There is a measure of deliverance that comes to us whenever we praise God. Be because, first of all, we're supposed to just be doing it because God is worthy of it. He, he deserves it. We, we could say from our perspective, from our human perspective, that he has earned it. Now, we could say something theologically deeper. He doesn't have to earn anything. He just deserves it because, who, uh, because of who he is. But from our perspective, he's earned it. He's done something from, uh, for us, and he has earned our praise. praise. Deeper than that, he doesn't have to earn it. He just deserves it because he's God. Whenever a person is baptized in the Spirit, that is part of the message that is restored then, something that has been long lacking in the Christian church. Now, they'll talk about praise, and they'll talk about singing to God, and they'll even sing about God. But I don't think that they're genuine or they're sincere in their heart or their attitude. Not all of them, not all of the time. But we as Christian people are to be a people of praise. We are to be a people of praise. Not only does God deserve this, and he has earned this, and he wants this, and requests this, and demands this of us, but it's an expression of our faith as well. You read the book of Psalms and you read the book of Acts, 
Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises to God at midnight, and the prisoners heard them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, and all the doors were open, and all the bands were loosed. It's an expression of our faith to God. And you need to remember this and remind yourself of this, that you need to be a person of praise. If there's something that should characterize you, you should be a person of regular, habitual praise. And I don't mean just mindless singing to yourself, because I think that's somewhat on the order of what the worldly people do out there. You hear a tune on the radio, I'm talking about the worldly people, and you start whistling it and singing it. They do. They're not thinking about the song, don't mean anything, they just sing it. It just has a little influence mentally upon you. I think we should be deeper as Christian people than that. We have a lot of blessed songs and tunes around here that, you know, if you don't watch out, you just kind of get caught up. It's a nice song, got a nice tune and beat to it. Just you're whistling and singing along, just carrying along the time of day. But we need to be deeper than that. I'm not saying don't ever do that, but I'm saying make sure that you're doing more than that. Make sure that it is something that you are really sincere about and that it is significant in your life, that you're a person of praise. You're a person of praise when we come together and a person of praise whenever we depart from one another's presence and company. But you are a person of praise. God is going to honor and deliver people. He tells us that, that if we will praise him, he's going to manifest his salvation to us, manifest our salvation to us if we'll praise him. And you know all the examples from the crossing of the Red Sea to Jehoshaphat and the singers in 2 Chronicles 20, to Paul and Silas praying and singing praises to God at midnight. You need to worship the Lord. Amen. With all of the various ways that we have, instruments and songs and a variety of different songs, we need to praise God. This is what the book of Psalms, among other things, is teaching us and telling us, that we need to be a people of praise. They were people of praise, the Old Testament Jews. The righteous ones were. They had a hymn book written especially for them so they could pick it up and learn the hymns and the songs of worship to God. And so many of the, the things there are personal, and then so many others are um, in the millennial future, talking about all nations coming and bowing down before him. You can't, you can't put that for today. That has never happened in history, never shall happen until the end when all Gentiles will bow their knee to Jesus Christ. Those that don't have already been destroyed. Those that do enter this glorious period of the millennium. Why, the Psalms, like around Psalm 93 and 4 and 5 and 6, these are glorious Psalms. They're speaking of the nations coming before God to serve him. Well, you can't end up with some post-millennialism from all of that. It is a millennial passage. Those are millennial psalms. They were looking to the distant future through the spirit of faith and the eye of prophecy. As Peter said, no doubt prophesying things they didn't fully understand or comprehend. They knew that God had given them a promise that through Abraham all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Now, they didn't exactly have it all figured out how that would happen, and it's taken what? Well, that's been about 4,000 years ago. And only in certain spiritual ways has parts of the world been blessed but there's coming a day when truly through abraham through abraham the whole world is going to be blessed because christ came through abraham and those who are blessed by jesus are truly blessed people and those who live in the millennium those who are given entrance into the millennium will only be those who are pleasing to jesus one day all that's going to literally be fulfilled that all of the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through what has come through abraham they knew they had that promise given to them and their nation. Now, how are we going to get this fulfilled? Uh, it's kind of hard. Every now and then you see an isolated exception of some heathen uh, woman or man coming over into Israel and accepting their faith. So you could say, well, there's a partial fulfillment, and that, that's true. Or where God in judgment just forces the heathen nations to their knees and forces them to say God is God and he alone is God. Or, or maybe a person who doesn't actually come over to, in, into Israel, but who has been influenced by the Jews like, like Naaman. Naaman in 2 Kings 5 was influenced by the faith of the prophet Elisha and went back home and still went with his master into the gods of the heathen. But he said, I pray God will forgive me whenever my Lord rests his hand upon my shoulder among the heathen gods. He didn't have a whole lot of light, but he had a little bit of light. You say a fulfillment of Genesis 12, 1 to 3? 
Well, partially. Christianity a fulfillment of that? Well, uh, to a large degree, but it's not final, though. It's not final. The psalmist kept saying all the nations. We're going to rejoice. All the nations are going to rejoice with the Lord. That has not happened yet. Now, the book of Psalms, I think you sang a song this morning about that. The book of Psalms is just filled with that. They were people of praise looking to a final last day when all the peoples of the earth are going to give glory and honor to the Lamb, Jesus Christ. All of what we're doing now, you see, is just in preparation. Look, the sun is coming out as I'm talking about it. <laughs> all, all of this is just in preparation. I mean, it is just in preparation for what we are going to experience, what God has in store for us in the future. We are to be, we must be a people of praise and be very concerned about our praise and be very committed to the message of praise. I mean, it is a biblical message. You talk about the message of healing or faith, you can talk about the message of praise. That is a message stressed over and over in the Bible. I mean, like hundreds of times in the Bible. That is a message stressed there. Now, I trust the Holy Spirit's going to take all that we're saying this morning and help apply this through your mind to your own heart and where you are in your life. You've got to remember, because you've got to want to remember, to be conscious of these things all the time. Not just here at church, although it's very important here. Whenever we get to be the kingdom together, but how about whenever you're a priest out there alone? God appreciates your praise. It blesses God, God's heart whenever you do praise him. He enjoys that. I know it makes other people nervous, but it doesn't make God nervous. He's accustomed to it. He gets it 24 hours a day from the heavenly spiritual creatures up there. God's not nervous by it. Other people get nervous whenever you praise him too much. God's not nervous. He's going to honor the man who praises him. God is going to honor you. John's wanting to get to this. To him be glory and dominion. Praise and honor and might and power and strength. To him be glory and dominion. Forever and ever. Amen. He's starting it right now by saying to him be that. He's not saying let's put it into the forever and ever future. He's saying, well, it's forever and ever, but forever and ever is whenever I'm talking about. That's part of ever. Now is a part of ever, isn't it? To him be glory and dominion, power, might, strength, honor, forever and ever. So our praise should, should be something that is significant in our life and powerful in our life and meaningful to us. Now, I know whenever you talk about the doxology, people in the churches think that you mean the doxology. <laughs> and we don't mean the doxology. Do it just comes from a Greek word that means praise. That's where we get the word doxology from, from a Greek word that means praise, to praise God. Like hallelujah comes from a Hebrew word, doxology, which if you don't watch out, you get your collar turned around backwards and get real stiff in your backbone whenever you talk about the doxology. Uh-oh, that sounds like we've got to be sing so deep that you're 20 leagues under the sea. Well, praise the Lord. The Lord gave us a way to sing it around here through a member in the body that you can actually be happy. You could even jump or tap your foot. The other one, you just had to get sad and start crying. You knew somebody was either had died or was fixing to die. Fixing, that's the word from the South, was fixing. Getting all the things ready to die. <laughs> Whenever you start singing, praise God. Do you remember that from the, oh, we sang it all the time. I, I think I told you the story. <laughs> I told you this once before. Forgive me, I'm going to tell you again. I was out on a backpacking trip over in the White Mountains of New Hampshire with some prospective theologians. Woe be whenever you're in a group like that. <laughs> And we had backpacked up to the top of one of these mountains over there, and it was just a horrible day, just drizzly and so overcast and cloudy and foggy. You couldn't see almost the person in front of you. We just stayed single file and, and went up this mountain. Well, we got up there, and you're supposed to be up high so that you can have this beautiful view. We just look out there, and it's just soup is all you can see. You can't see a thing. So we backed away. It was right on the ledge. I mean, it was a drop-off of hundreds of feet on the other side. We backed away from that a little bit, backed away a lot from it, because some people turn over in their sleep whenever you're sleeping at night. We backed away a long way from it and got all of our things set up that night. And we didn't have tents, but we had just pieces of plastic that we tied in the trees over us to protect us from the elements, from the soup around us, I guess, and crawled into our sleeping bags. And it pelted us 
like cats and dogs with rain that night. I don't know how we all survived and, and didn't look like a drowned rat the next morning. We were not in a tent. We just had a piece of plastic over us, and I mean it thundered. It stormed like it only can on top of a mountain. It lightened. It rained. I mean just pelted us. And I slept through it all. Everybody else seemed to do all right. And you think, oh, what a miserable way to have a backpacking trip. I mean, that's not any fun to go backpacking, camping, hiking. Nothing outdoors is fun when it's raining. And this is, I mean, doubly bad. This is just doubly bad. So we get up the next morning, though, and it is the most beautiful day. I mean, all that just blew over that night, blew down on us, and blew over and went away. It was a gorgeous day. And uh, so the leader of the group, uh, the major leader, had all of us divided up into smaller little groups, but... The big leader said, well, you know, you gotta, if you're a denominational person, you have your morning devotional. Now, I'm not, you should have a morning devotional, but I mean it's like a religious duty. You have your morning devos, they call them, morning devos, or they call it quiet time. Qui Did you notice that? Quiet. Don't say anything. <laughs> it's called a quiet time. You ought to have a loud time. Yeah, in the morning, you ought to have a loud time. You, if you want to have a quiet one, also have both of them. But for them, it's only one. You only have one choice. Let's have a quiet time. Well, you go out in your individual group. So my group goes out there. We were led by a West Pointer, a graduate from West Point, who was now going to be working on some theological degrees. So we got out there on the edge of the ledge where you could just see over, and the only thing that was left from the night before was some fog down at the bottom of the valley. The sun had risen, was burning all that fog off of the land, and right down the very bottom of the valley, you couldn't see the river flowing down there because there was too much fog. And as we stayed, then, see, we were going to rappel down the side of this. That's why we were up there on that ledge. We weren't just up there because we were just up there. We were up there for a reason. And finally, it did burn away all of the fog down there. We got out there in our little group, and you sit, you know, Indian style on the ground. You look around at each other. And uh, he's kind of embarrassed because everybody's, you know, if you're non-charismatic, you're just embarrassed to be spiritual in front of other people. You're embarrassed over your relationship with God. Now, a true believer, certainly one filled with the Spirit, he's not like that. He's not embarrassed. But when you're non-charismatic, you're just embarrassed to be, to be vocal or to be, to be intimate or, or to, uh, to be spiritual around other people. You'll, you'll talk about being it at home or by yourself, but now, whenever it counts and the heat is on, you're in front of everybody else. So our leaders sitting there, you know, what do we do next, kind of looking around nervously. Well, why don't we all sing the doxology? And, you know, I'm looking around at this glorious creation. Doxology happens to be a perfectly fine song, beautiful words in it, a little stiff the way you sing it, but it's an otherwise beautiful song. And I think how ironic it is, this beautiful creation around us, and all we can do is sit here, praise God from whom all blessings flow. I think if you're really excited about it, say, praise God, hallelujah. Yeah. Praise the Lord about it. You remind me of church to sing like that. <laughs> God deliver us from that atmosphere. As quiet as a church mouse. They're quiet. They've learned by example from the others around them, the mice, to be quiet in church. Oh, my. I thought how ironic. We're out here in this glorious creation we have a wonderful, I mean, the Lord just could have sent another thunderstorm to send us back down off the top of that mountain. He gave us a beautiful day up there, and all he can think of is, let's praise God. And how do you praise God if you're a Christian? You sing the doxology. You sing the doxology. There's only one doxology. It's praise God from whom all blessings flow. Well, here's a doxology to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. That's a doxology. That's not praise God from whom all blessings flow. There are many doxologies in Scripture. By the way, let's, let's give you some of those. Go over to the book of Romans here. We'll kind of go right through in order. And I want to show you how it was just spontaneous for the early Christian community. We see this through the, their leaders, the writers of Scripture. It was spontaneous for them as they were just discussing divers and various matters to slip in a, well, praise God forevermore for that. Amen. I think you've got biblical warrant for your little ejaculations of hallelujah thank you jesus praise god in your conversations because the apostles did in writing scripture non-charismatics are offended whenever you're talking 
in a conversation and you say, praise the Lord. I mean, is they, what would you say? And you know how natural it is around here and you get out with someone and you just carry over that natural, praise the Lord. You even call people, I find myself calling someone a brother and I, well, not, not a brother. <laughs> You ever found yourself doing that? Hey, bro. Uh. Because you call everybody else brother or sister. And, you know, bless the poor unbeliever's hearts. You have to forgive them here, folks, because they're, they're so, they just don't know what's going on. The, the only way they could view us. Okay, try to put yourself outside of a charismatic group like ours, others, ours or others like ours. And you got people calling each other brother and sister. You think, is this some Franciscan monastery or something? It must sound so strange to those people. It's so natural to us. But I, I try sometimes to think, what would it sound like to me? If I just, they were saying brother and sister, I think, well, you little homey group of you, whatever is there. <laughs> you little homey group, brother and sister, this. That's got biblical support for it. By the way, I'm going to talk about that, even that terminology later in Revelation. How much later? Three verses. Revelation 1, 9, where John says, I am your brother and companion in tribulation. I'll have some things to say about that. So I don't need to go maybe say too much or go too far this morning, but I found myself, I found myself the other day, accidentally, I let it slip out, calling this heathen my brother, because it's just, it's a customary thing for us to do. We're generally around each other, and then whenever you go out, you have to change just a little bit your language and terminology to call them you heathen <laughs> instead of my brother. <laughs> Well, you could think, well, brother, in the sense we're all descended from Adam. So I guess you got some way to explain that theologically. But what I was talking about are the non-charismatics and unsaved people, for that matter, who are offended, especially non-charismatics, so religious people. When you say, thank you, Jesus, in a conversation, they just think that is not appropriate. Jesus is God. You just don't use his name in conversations like that. You talk about him when you go to church or you talk about him if you're sitting under a seminary professor who is lecturing on the doctrine of Christ or something, then it's when you, t you don't talk about him at other times. For the